It's time now for the Sports Objective Podcast. No talking heads, just guys who love sports. Here's Dave Richmond. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. I am Dave Richmond, along with my good buddy and co-host, and that's Bubba Rosenbaum. How are you, sir? Doing well. It's a scorcher here in the western part of the state, and I know it is down east as well. It was uh, right around 95 today. Well, the good news is uh, you haven't been to my house, but we've got a million trees. That's the only good thing about the trees in our yard, but it's uh, it's an 80s in the shade, uh, I, I know, but 84, something like that in the shade. It, I think it really takes off about, I'd say, a, a five or six degrees at least, but uh, definitely... Uh, Definitely been really hot. Unbelievable, by the way, Bubba, at practice today. This is our, um, I want to tell folks, our weekend podcast, by the way. So we appreciate a lot of fans of the podcast listening on the weekends. And uh, catch up is what I've been told. So thank you so much for uh, spending your weekend with us. Or sometimes people can't make, listen, you listen during the week. So, uh, Bubba, I know that uh, we've got a huge show with uh, two great guests. Yeah, we do. Um, we're obviously right here um, in football mode, but um, we have a couple of great baseball guests. And you know, first, it's going to be Dave Dravecki, a guy that was a tremendous pitcher. Uh, he was originally uh, from the Midwest, um, but pitched in the Padres organization, and then also um, also pitched with the San Francisco Giants for two and a half seasons there in the late '80s. So it's great catching with him. He has a tremendous story uh, besides just the fact that he was a tremendous pitcher. Uh, so it was great catching up with him. And um, I, I kind of like you say all the time, I certainly learned a, a lot more about Dave Dravecki than what I already knew. And then uh, also we're going to be catching up with a guy who is no stranger to uh, folks in Eastern North Carolina and baseball fans a lot of places across the country, and that's George Whitfield. He He's in so many different halls of fame. Um, I know he's in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame, uh, the American Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame, and several others. And um, he was the National Baseball Coach of the Year on the high school level twice. I want to say it was 69 and 74. Um, and he he, co- he coached at Goldsboro High, also Hamlet um, prior to um, Richmond Senior opening up. And then he was there, like you'll hear in the interview, for two and a half decades and and then he was also on Keith LeClaire's staff. So it was awesome catching up with Coach Witt. Uh, he, he's just so extremely sharp. Uh, he is, he's 82 years young because you, you would never know, um, with talking to him. He's, he's so sharp. He really is. And I hope that I have half the, the brain that that man does, uh, even right now at 46. So, uh, half his age, but, uh, Appreciate him, both of them coming on. And Bubba, I know we want to talk a couple minutes. Uh, any notes you have, real quick, and then we'll get to Dave Trevecki. Yeah, kind of some random notes, but sticking with the baseball thing, Thomas Francisco, um, he obviously made significant contributions for the Pirates this year and in spot starts and in also reserve role, um, playing behind the likes of Spencer Brickhouse and Bryant Packard. Um, but but Franny, he's up in the Valley League this summer with the Charlottesville Tom Sox. And the Tom Sox won the Valley League, and then Thomas Francisco led the Valley League in batting average. Um, batted well over 400. I want to say is even up there, maybe pushing 450. It was something. It was video game like numbers. It was uh, something like Bryant Packard did in the uh, 2018 season. Um, but I mean, that's great for Franny, and um, obviously Alec Burleson had a tremendous summer as well for Team USA. Had the walk off home run to beat Japan over in Tokyo. Uh, so um, in, in Alec Burleson and then also Gavin Williams, they were ranked by Baseball America as two of the top 50 um, players for next year's draft. That is collegiate players. That doesn't take high school guys right. into consideration, but that's still obviously a tremendous honor and talks about the uh, talent that Cliff Godwin, Jeff Palumbo, and staff have, have assembled in Greenville. Tremendous. Uh, says a lot. We'll, we'll talk later with George about Cliff in the interview later on, but uh, thank the world of Cliff Godwin. Um, I, I'm not, you'll never hear me say a negative word about Cliff Godwin because I've always liked him as a player. He's an alum. He really gets what it means to be a pirate, being a local guy from Snow Hill and Greene County right next door to Pitt County and Greenville. I mean, you can't ask for anything better. And uh, I know that when he, you know, when he loses, uh, it's a big deal. And, um, the talent that he's bringing in, I mean, my God, I don't know how you could 
argue that we could be even better. I know that he probably would say that we could get better. Um, we always were, there's room to get better, but the talents there, the uh, program is in the right direction, and probably our top. You'd have to you'd hard to argue that's not our top program at East Carolina right now. So, Coach Godwin is uh, tremendous, and um, I tell you, you remember uh, was it Brian Packard uh, that said that uh, he felt like. Uh, that Thomas Francisco was the best hitter on the team, like coming up, like meaning after him. Right. Like I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't recall if it, it may have been Pat, um, but I, I recall I, I recall that comment, and, yeah, because um, it was certainly high praise on considering the, the types of bats that we had <laughs> yeah. on, the, on, the, on the team and in the program. Um, but I'll tell you what, Dave, let's go ahead and go to that first interview with uh, Dave Dravecki. Um pitcher in the major leagues for nine seasons and let's talk to him right now well Bubba it's uh hot here in North Carolina I know it's uh, a little bit cooler I'm sure in San Francisco and we have a very special guest we're very excited to have on with us today yeah we really do um, we have someone that's um he actually played professional baseball for someone who's very near and dear to your heart um um, Roger Craig, and then so um, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, but we're very excited to have former major league pitcher and uh, author, motivational speaker Dave Dravecki. And Dave, welcome in. Uh, thank you. It's great talking with you guys. Absolutely, Dave. Uh, followed your career for many years, and I know we wanted to talk about that. I know Bubba uh, wanted we wanted to talk about. I know you had a special relationship, obviously, with your dad. He's the one that started you with, uh, I guess, your interest in baseball. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, it's really interesting to bring that up because um, just the other day um, I was talking about that with someone. We were talking about different movies that we love, and I'm reminded of Field of Dreams, and you know, the whole purpose of that movie was built around this voice, build it, and he will come, and you know, wanting to know the answer to that. And it goes to the scene at the end with, um, you know, the catch with his dad. And so yeah. it was just a reminder once again of, you know, growing up as a kid and, uh, you know, at four thirty, five 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be standing out on the driveway playing catch with myself until my dad got home and he worked as a machinist and, uh, he'd come around the corner and he'd see me and I'd, I'd notice that he saw me and his eyes would roll in the back of his head. Like, Oh my gosh, here we go. Got to do it again. <laughs> and he he pull in the driveway and he was dirty and greasy from working in the machine shop and and uh he'd look at me and he'd go, Give me ten minutes and I'll meet you in the backyard and so that just um was the beginning of what my parents were able to do as cheerleaders in developing a love and instilling a love uh for the game. Dave, I know you went on to to play for Youngstown State. Uh, you're from Youngstown, Ohio. You, know, you walked on for the Penguins, and um, I believe in your first start, you actually threw a no hitter. Yes, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, the, well, you know the uh, the irony of all of that is that uh, because I chose to go to spring break um, that spring, uh, when I got back from spring break, uh, there were uh, you know voluntary practices, and I was gone. And so when I got back, there wasn't a uniform for me. And I actually had to wait two weeks into the season because I chose to go off on my own and not be a part of the team, which was a huge lesson for me. Um, but when I finally got my uniform, I was told I was going to pitch on the back end of a doubleheader against the Akron Zips and ended up throwing a no-hitter. And Dom Roselli was the baseball coach at the time, and he pulled me over at our post-game meal, which was at McDonald's. And... Um, <laughs> And he said, hey, I think we're going to give you a scholarship, kid, but we can't do it this year. But the last three years, depending on how long you stay, um, we'll cover your uh, you know, your college tuition. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, Dave, I know uh, following your career and then you uh, went on to start off with the Padres. Uh, how special was that uh, to be in San Diego? I know I think you were there for, what, five seasons, five, six seasons? Yeah, five seasons. And – that was a great time there. As a matter of fact, um, you know, when I was traded to San Francisco in 87, um, because we had been there four or five years, Jan and I were planning, my wife and I were planning on really settling in to San Diego and planning our roots. And we had started um, developing relationships with people so that after the game, uh, Dave would have something to do. 
and it was such a total shock. But those five years in San Diego were absolutely wonderful. Met some incredible people and had just a, a great time with the experiences of an all-star game in 83 and the World Series in 84. And I know that you had a very special relationship. Bubba, I know you wanted to talk about that with uh, the catcher there in San Diego. Right. Uh, any, anyone who uh, follows baseball closely is uh, certainly aware of Bruce Bochy. And uh, I actually watched an interview with you in the last day or two um, where you were talking about his nickname, Buckethead. Uh, so to talk, to talk about your relationship with Buckethead. Well, you know what? Um, <laughs> Boach. Boach was an incredible teammate, and you know, um, at the time, I didn't know that he had this desire to actually manage baseball, but you knew, um, just because of the way he handled pitchers, um, that he was really smart, he was a student of the game, and I'll never forget, um, you know, we were, in, we were on our spring training run, and we ended up in Palm Springs, and I ended up being his roommate for the time in Palm Springs, and so I, that's where I got to know Boach a little bit outside of just being a teammate. And one thing that I did come to understand was that he likes his country western music. And <laughs> my goodness gracious, that guy played it all day long. And, and so Sweet Home Alabama was just a the theme in my head. <laughs> but had a great time with Boach, and he was a wonderful receiver. You know, I like the big guys. I like the big target behind the dish. And between Terry Kennedy and Bruce Bochy, um, you know, you got big guys back there, and, and yeah. it was just really easy for me to throw to them. We'll now, talk about, go ahead, uh, Bubba. Very quickly, no problem. Before we move on, I just wanted to ask um, – uh, obviously, I'm more familiar with Bruce Bochy as uh, his professional career, uh, more, and, and more so just as a manager. Um, but uh, taking us back, did uh, did Buckethead did he did he play in um, the college, or did he go directly into professional ball? You know, I really don't know. Um, uh, that's a great question. Um, I know that you know they traveled a lot because his dad was in the military. Um, but I don't know if he went, it off, went off to college and, and was drafted out of college or high school. Cool. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question. Yeah. But I, I do know this. Um, what this man has been able to do over his career um, has definitely earned him a spot in the Hall of Fame. And when you talk to him and his wife, Kim, they always look at you and say, no, 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 we're not Hall of Famers. And, you know, we really appreciate the kind words, but, um, you know, you never know what's going to happen with that. Well, with everything that he's been able to do as a manager in the game, there's no question in my mind and many others, especially out here in San Francisco, that uh, he'll get inducted into the Hall of Fame. So we're pretty excited about that, and especially – having an opportunity to be his teammate and to actually play ball with him and to see the things he's accomplished in the game. But even more so than that, Bruce is just a wonderful man and has done a lot of good outside the game for people too. So that just makes it even more special. Dave, I was going to ask you as far as going to uh, San Francisco, can you talk about your time there? It seemed like that you were there longer than – I know that <laughs> – I wanted you were there, but it seemed like you were there longer than just a few seasons. I, while I was looking back over again, I thought it was more than that. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing um, that I was only there for uh, two and a half years, um, to be exact, um, being traded uh, July 5th um, in 87 over to the Giants and going from a last-place team to a first-place team was absolutely amazing. Um, and then on top of that, you know, when I met the home baby, uh, my first – introduction to him outside of playing against them was being called up to the um to the manager's office in chicago when we got traded and flew into chicago the next day um kevin mitchell craig lefferts and myself were asked to go up to the manager's office and we sat down with hum baby uh storm and norman norm sherry and um al rosen and as we sat there you know obviously we're a part of a new organization a little apprehensive you know, you're traded, which means you're not wanted, but then you're traded to a team that actually wants you, but you don't know what to expect and, and what to think as you're sitting there. And the three of them looked at the three of us and said, you guys are key pieces of the puzzle that are going to take us to the promised land. And as soon as they said that, it was like, who did wow. I used to play for? <laughs> so it was so cool. 
and then you know to develop a relationship over those years with uh, with Hum Baby and um, I just came to love him and respect him and admire him um, not just as a manager but as a human being and so that was just a really special time for me and and you know I've got to tell you it, it felt like I played there my entire career I mean and that's how I've been treated up uh, you know I'm now back in the city and um, uh, do things for the Giants as an ambassador. So it's been, a, it's been a great journey with this organization. I wanted to, selfishly, I wanted to take a moment to tell a story uh, about the Dave Director Becky before the best-selling books and motivational speaker. I was 15 years old, and we were, for people that don't know that anything about baseball or professional sports, they have like a hotel where the team is staying, and we stayed at the Marriott Marquis in Atlanta, and I was down there for a Braves game, and you and several of the players were going, and you happened to see I had a San Francisco Giant hat on, and you, you and the guys were so good to me. You didn't know who I was or anything, and I'll never forget that, and it meant a lot to me. You were getting ready to go down an escalator, and you stopped, and I didn't even ask for an autograph. I was just standing there, and you, uh, mm. you guys really were good to me, so that meant a lot. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm really glad it ended up being a good story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a bad the bad ones. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not a bad story at all. And uh, oh, that meant a lot cool. to me. And, and then when you meet guys that are your heroes and you meet guys that you follow closely, and uh, I just want to ask you when you're talking about Hum Baby, for people that don't know, that's my great uncle, Roger Craig, and he always jokes with me and tells me, please do not refer to me as your great uncle because that makes me feel old. So I have to say Uncle Roger. So um, <laughs> can you talk about him? And uh, I know you were talking about uh, the special relationship and what he means to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, as I look back on my career, you know, there's, there's uh, people along the way that have an impact on your life and on your career. And I think um, one of the things that Humbaby helped me with, obviously, was as a pitcher, and he being a pitcher too as well. Um, that was there were just things that he was able to walk me through. Um, he and Norm Sherry were a great team together in working with the pitching staff, and so um, from the standpoint of the game, he gave so much to me that I was able to utilize, and a lot of that came. And you know, it's really interesting. So much of that came from his demeanor. It was the way he went about managing the game. It was the way he went about putting on his uniform. He made, it was fun for him. He loved what he did. And that obviously will, you know, um, rub off on the people around you. And so he made it a lot of fun to come to the ballpark because he was having fun. And I will never forget that about him. Um, he's, he's always, you know, he, he brought that when I see him at special events that he comes out to, uh, for the giants, he's got that same smile on his face. Yeah. He's got, he's got those same goofy phrases that he says <laughs> to you. <laughs> and, and it's just so endearing. And so for me, um, it's those kinds of things that have a longer lasting impact than trying to teach me how to throw that split finger fastball. Oh my God! Yeah, very hard. Oh, he lived and died on that split finger, and it hurt my elbow so bad. <laughs> and I kept telling him, "Home, baby, I can't throw the pitch. I can't throw." And he goes, "Okay, just stick with your sinker and your cutter. You're good." <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I wanted to add to uh, what you're saying about a uh, very cool story. They, uh, for Father's Day, his daughter Sherry and the family. Yeah, uh, he and Norm Sherry back together for Father's Day, and I think that's the first time they've seen each other in many years. So, oh, I thought that was really neat. Yeah, that is so cool because I know those guys were so close. Um, you know, during those years when they were together, um, you know, working, you know, side by side. So that's really awesome. Yeah, as far as uh, as far as the Giants and of course Uncle Roger, um, can you talk about? Um, the whole experience now. We obviously want to plug the books. Folks, I have both of them. Um, both books are outstanding. Can you talk about uh, the whole experience with uh, with 89? It's a huge year for the Giants and instead, it actually, I know a little before that, but I know that it was tough for you with uh, symptoms or how did it all start about that you were noticing things with your left arm? Yeah, it was actually in 1988 that um, right. 
at the end of the season um, when I was diagnosed. And, you know, it was, uh, it was really bizarre because I opened up on opening day and I'll never forget being in spring training and hum baby telling me you're, you're my, you're my number one starter out of the gate and you're going to be opening up against the Dodgers in Dodger stadium. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is going to be such an incredible honor. And, you know, that was one of the special things about starting is to be given the ball on opening day. That was just a special honor. At least it was for me. And, you know, it's one of those things you want to check off as a pitcher, you know, no hitters, another one, um, you know, winning in postseason play. But, but that was a really special honor. So it all started with that. And on opening day, I'll never forget first pitch I throw Steve Sachs. It's a home run. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is this what, is this what this game's going to be like today? And, you know, I settled in and ended up only giving up three hits after that. And we won five to one. And I was thinking, man, I'm going to, I'm going to win 20 games this year. So by the end of that season, obviously it was a totally different story and a small lump uh, that was on my arm. It developed into half the size of a golf ball sticking out of the left arm halfway between the shoulder and the elbow. And so as a result of that, um, I went in and had an MRI and, they told me I had cancer, and then outside of a miracle, I'd never pitch. Um, ten months later, after intense rehabilitation, a lot of highs, a lot of lows, a lot of struggles in all of that, um, Al Rosen and Hum Baby and Norm Sherry say, it's time to go. And so on August 10th, you're getting your first start back in the big leagues, and it was against the Cincinnati Reds, and gosh, it was an amazing day, and we won that game 4-3, to three, and Oh, I pitched eight innings and 93 pitches. That would have never happened today. And um, it was just an amazing, amazing day. Um, And then five days later, I'm in Montreal and and feeling great and everything's going well. And the next thing you know, I rear back and throw a pitch uh, to Tim Raines in the sixth inning and my left arm snaps in half and I go falling to the ground. And and needless to say, the, the career comes to an end. And so 1989 was was um, a season of uh, a lot of highs, a lot of lows, some significant frustrations through the rehabilitation and struggle. But to get to the other side and compete again, that was such an amazing gift. Um, and, you know, for it to end the way it did, um, you know, I look back on that period of time and just go, you know, um, nobody expected me to pitch at all. And I, I actually was 2-0 and in 1989, so I went out undefeated. I haven't thought about that. That's a good point. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, that was it was an amazing year. It really was. One of the th- Sorry, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to add the fact that, for folks that don't remember, that was the year of, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Earthquake World Series. I was supposed to go to that series and uh, I was supposed to go to Game 3 in Oakland, and Tuesday night, I'm watching a game, and I laughed at my dad because I said somebody just got fired because it was color bars on the screen, and little did I know that it was an earthquake happening. So that's why there was color bars on the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a that was a pretty crazy time um, when the earth started shaking, and I remember sitting in the clubhouse with Bob Nepper, and when that started, when the earth started moving, it sounded like a freight train came through the clubhouse, and we just bolted to the parking lot. Well, then Al Michaels who was doing the game uh, at that time on, I believe, ABC. Was yeah. he went from doing play-by-play to being from the area? So he was. They had, I guess, the helicopter and going around through the footage instead of doing what you would think would be the third game of the World Series. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a, a pretty sobering time in this area, and seeing the Marina District go up in flames and part of the. Bay Bridge collapsing, and then we didn't even know about what was going on with the Cypress, Cypress Bridge collapsing, but um, uh, it, it, it devastated a community for a significant amount of time. And, you know, they, they, they kept focus of trying to get the World Series to finish, and I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. I think they were hoping that it would, would bring a community together in the midst of, you know, a tragic, you know, uh, thing like an earthquake and um you know that was that was just really really difficult and it was hard for players who wants to play after you've experienced that right and then there then there was like a 12-day delay and um when we came back 
I just don't know that there was anything left in the tank. And so we ended up losing two more games to the A's, and they won the um, the Battle of the Bay. And unfortunately, we were on the losing end. Um, but um, still, it was a great year for our ball club, and we had such a great group of guys. And, and that was, uh, you know, that year for me in particular, I look back now, and it really set the stage for where I'm at today. So I'm extremely grateful for, for the whole experience. Dave, one of the questions I had for you, with our podcast being based out of North Carolina, um, that's what one of the, the excellent prospects has come out of here and um, just done remarkable things with the Giants over the last decade or so, uh, is, of course, Madison Bumgarner. He, he went yeah. to South Caldwell High School, um, and I know you're very close uh, to the Giants organization. So um, talk a little bit about uh, Madison Bumgarner and um, if you've had an opportunity to develop a relationship with him. Well, I, I haven't had an opportunity to develop a relationship with him, but I have a relationship with him. And, and um, on several occasions we've talked, and I can tell you, um, number one, I love the way the guy goes about the, his business and how he plays the game. You know, he's, he's intense. He's, he's focused. Um, you know, I just, uh, there's obviously I've got this love for left-handers. So, you know, um, that just comes with the turf, but, um, his competitive nature is absolutely amazing. But even more than that, you, you, you get, you get him in a place where you can just sit and talk to him and get to know him a little bit. And he's just a great guy. You know, um, he's a team guy. Everything is about team. Um, what's been fascinating to watch as he's gone through all the rumors about being traded this season and how he's gone about doing um, what he loves to do most, and that's going out on the bump every fifth day, and how he's handled that with the press has been absolutely amazing. So many guys would have uh, taken it um, and, and seen it as something negative and allowed the pressure to affect them. Um, but he just keeps saying, look, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm in a giant uniform, and that means I'm a giant until I'm no longer in this uniform. And so when I go out there every fifth day, I'm helping these guys win because that's our focus is to get into the postseason. Gosh, you, you, you know, that is, that is a great example for any young player out there, um, especially in professional sports, is to keep the main thing the main thing. And Matt Bum knows how to keep the main thing the main thing. And on top of that, he's a wonderful young man. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I just hope he stays in this uniform as a giant for a whole lot longer. And, of course, winning the World Series, we know that he knows how to shotgun a beer. So I remember that. <laughs> uh, <like it's> <laughs> that, was very, that was very impressive, very impressive. Uh, in fact, my daughter was very, very young, and uh, she watched that game where he just – I mean, I, just, I haven't seen – and I know you're a pitcher. I wanted you to comment on this real quick since we're on the subject of him. Have you seen a pitcher in our lifetime that's dominated a series the way that he did back, what, in 2014? Um. No, not the way he has, um, because not only did he start, but he relieved, and you know, and, and I think, and I think the key uh, to pitching today, and the prototype for a good pitcher today is Madison Bumgarner. What what breaks my heart when I watch baseball today and I watch starting pitchers, um, and I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. Adam Wainwright, um, who pitches with the Cardinals. Um, made the comment that uh, he sees that the, the starters, um, once they get to the fifth inning, they start looking to the to the bench. Yeah. When are you going to take me out? <laughs> you know, and it's like, wait a minute. You know, the idea is as a starter, you get the ball for the first pitch, and you want to be the one throwing the last pitch. Right. And so, what I admire so much about Mad Bum is that's his mentality. He's not looking to get yanked. He gets the ball for the first pitch, and he wants the ball for the last pitch. And that guy does whatever it takes, and he's able to make the good pitches when he needs to make those good pitches. But there was something about uh, postseason that elevated his game that was absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, there's. I don't think they'll. I don't. I don't think we'll see that in a long time, especially the direction that pitching seems to go in 
you know, when they're using an opener and doing all these weird things today, which I guess is a part of taking risk and change and, you know, bringing, breathing some life into the game. But at the same time, you know, I'm old school and that's probably why I love Madison so much. He's old school. No doubt about it. And I wanted to ask a quick question. Speaking of uh, you were talking about earlier with uncle Roger, with the split finger fastball and the arm, do you think that um, when you don't see these guys pitching uh, complete games anymore, or at least seventh, eighth inning deep into it, do you think that we're actually saving them too much? Because it seems like there's more, maybe it's just me or maybe because of social media and uh, more attention to baseball now with major leagues. But we hear about arm injuries all the time. It seems like it's even more than when you guys pitched 30, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to figure out, um, you know, why, why are guys having, I mean, Tommy John surgery, all these kids that at least what the gun is, is, is supposed to be registering if it is true that it's 100 mile an hour because there's a question even about the guns that are being used today and how they measure velocity. Um, if it's true, then, uh, you know, the bottom line is that, um, you know, these kids, maybe the body is just not made to throw a ball that fast. Mm. You can develop the strength to throw a ball that fast, but sooner or later that arm is going to break down. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. I have a, um, a relationship with a family, um, and they're a family of doctors, and one of the members of the family is Tony Romeo, who did Jake PB surgery and several other ball players who were actually coming to the ends of their careers and this guy and Tony saved their careers and he has been doing some studies um, and they have developed a nonprofit to look at pitching and the impact of why arms are you know breaking down so much and one of the conclusions that they've come to is that it's not necessarily the breaking ball but it's how much kids are throwing early in their lives and and how hard they're throwing, um, developing strength to throw hard. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's it's a really unique thing, and I don't know, you know, what the answer is. Dave, I want to ask you as far as uh, like now with your platform you have with. Uh, unfortunately, what happened to you, your faith. Can you talk about your faith and obviously the motivational speaking? It, it seems like to me, I've always felt like when that happened, obviously I was very upset for you personally, very upset for the team. But over the years after reading those books, um, which are fantastic, by the way, folks, um, come back when you can't come back. Um, do you feel like that, that was just that God gave you that purpose to, to be on that kind of stage in the major leagues and now you're doing what your purpose really is? Yeah, I really do. Um, uh, you know, when I look back at what happened, um, you know, I ask myself the question, why didn't my arm break before I got to the big leagues? I had pitched three minor league games um, prior to getting to the big leagues, and why was I allowed to be elevated to the very top with an eight-inning victory um, and then only five days later to have the arm break? And the attention literally of the world was on me. And, and you know, so when I broke my arm, and, and I'm being honest when I say this, when I broke my arm, the question that I asked was, oh, my gosh, God, what are you up to now? There is something going on in my life that's bigger than baseball. And, you know, guys, I've got to tell you that um, uh, the whole experience, I believe, set the stage for what my wife and I would do with the rest of our life. And, and that was... Uh, to actually come alongside people who experience pain and suffering and encourage them in the same way that we were encouraged and to help them to um, discover God in the midst of their hurt. Because that age-old question that has been out there for years and years and years, when you enter into pain and suffering is, where is God when it hurts? And what we try to help people see through our ministry, Endurance, is that God's in the middle of your story if you're willing to look for him and to see how much he loves and cares for you by the way those around you are loving and caring for you. Because I'm convinced that um, uh, God uses us um, to display how much he loves and cares for, the, um, for this world. And if more of us could understand that instead of trying to push God 
outside of the marketplace, invite him back in, um, I think we'd see a lot of healing in our country. And and for Jan and I, the focus is really around being able to encourage those um, that have suffered much like we have um, by coming alongside them and loving them through our ministry. So, you know, if, if there's anybody that's listening to this, Dave, I, I would encourage them just to go to our website, endurance.org. Um, we offer a, a free gift um, to anybody that's hurting or if you know a loved one that's hurting and battling with cancer or depression, um, just to go to that website, and there's a place where you can click on for a free encouragement gift, and we'll send that out to you um, uh, in, in hopes that it will be an encouragement to you. Um, so, yeah, it's been amazing to see how God has um, been in the middle of this entire journey. And I have to be honest, it hasn't been pretty. Um, when I share my story, it's about the good, it's about the bad, and it's about the ugly, because that's my story. And yet, God's grace in the middle of all of that is what got us through. And he used my wife in a significant way um, uh, to love me in the midst of being the most unloving, unlovable man um, that could be. And yet, she stayed in it. And as a result of that, we both have gotten to the other side. And I, in particular, have learned to understand God's grace in much greater ways because of her. Is there a place where people can contact you as far as public speaking too? I know that you do an outstanding job with that, and we wanted to plug that. And obviously, the books. Before we let you go, I, I looked at the time; we've kept you way too long. But I appreciate oh, you time too. No, it's been my pleasure talking to you guys. Actually, for the books, you can go to endurance.org because we have a um, a bookstore there where we carry all our books. Oh, cool. Um, or, or or Amazon may have them still, um, but the uh, website for speaking is. Um, uh, DaveDravecki.com and uh, you can go to DaveDravecki.com and, and on the website um, is my assistant's email and her phone number to be able to contact her for um, any requests for speaking. And we appreciate her helping us uh, with the interview. Thank you so much. I'm going to send this interview to uh, Uncle Roger to Home Baby and I know that he'll be happy to hear this uh, his daughter Sherry and uh, we'll it. do that. Thank you so much for coming on, and we'll send all the links to, to the interview as well. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Dave. Okay, take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What an honor to have Dave Trevecki on the podcast, Bubba. Uh, people may not know my relationship uh, with my great-uncle Roger Craig, but Dave Trevecki, as you heard in that interview, uh, meant a lot to me, and um, it was uh, devastating as a fan, as someone that was close to my uncle, knowing what he was going through, um, not only is, um, as you know, Bubba, coaching, you get attached to these players, and I just can't imagine what he was going through just as a manager of the guy, but also what Dave was going through, and he talked about the ups and downs and all that, but uh, just such an uh, inspiration, and at the end of the interview, I really was sincere. I've always wanted to ask him that question. I really believe that gave him the platform to do his purpose in life, and it gave him stronger faith, something we don't talk a lot about on the program, but what a great thing, and very excited to have him on. He was certainly one on the bucket list I've wanted to have on since the beginning of this podcast, so thank you, Dave, for coming on. A tremendous uh, job coming on. I did a great interview, and I'll tell you what, Bob, I failed to mention that interview, by the way, listening back to that interview um, right now was the fact that his voice, he could do radio, he could do a podcast himself, don't you think? Yeah, man, so he has a lot of um, speaking experience, and I, I know, like you said, I believe his, his title is Ambassador for the the Giants, something of that nature, uh, mm-hmm. but but he does an excellent job with that. I've seen some videos on YouTube when I was preparing for the interview, uh, just developing an even better feel for exactly who Dave Drewbecki is, and... Um, and yeah, he he does awesome work for the Giants still to this day. Um, kind of some other non-baseball notes before we go to that interview with George Whitfield. Uh, Harold Varner the third, HB three, is playing in the Northern Trust tournament up in um, Jersey City, New Jersey, and that is being played at the Liberty National Golf Course. And la- last check, as of of about oh uh, six thirty or so, a little after six thirty on Friday evening. 
Uh, he is tied for 14th at 7-under. That is a par 71 course. He shot 4-under, 67 on uh, Thursday, and then he's 3-under through 17 holes today. And then um, a couple other uh, notes, and these are football-related. Um, this is something um, we'll, we'll start away from home. I saw this on Twitter a couple days ago. Uh, I want to say maybe it was Brett McMurphy or somebody tweeted this and it really jumped out at me obviously matt campbell's doing an excellent job at iowa state but take a guess dave at, at how many have you have you seen this as far as the number of season tickets iowa state has sold this year no i'm gonna have to defer back to you i missed that one take it and take a guess iowa state i am going to say seventeen thousand. well two and a half times that 43 oh Forty three thousand five seventy, and that, that that just that just blew me away. Wow! Well, I knew it was going to be a big number, but I, I was afraid to go too high because you're like Dave, um, right? I knew I, I couldn't win either way on that one, but that is impressive. And I just, you know what? We could have that at East Carolina uh, with the the success of Mike Houston, which I really believe will happen. Some people think I'm crazy to praise him, and he hasn't coached it down yet, but. If you've been around the program and you know that the three of us, you, me, and Kyle, um, follow the program so close, and even closer now because there's a thing called a podcast we do. Right. Um, and I've been out there practice. I'm telling you, Bubba, the practices are so much, oh, my God, you would be, I can't wait for you to be able to be at a practice with me, and same thing with Kyle. So uh, a lot of good things there with Coach Houston. And uh, I'm not saying it'll be turned, the program will be turned around overnight. I'm not saying that. But I think if you look at the program where it's been, and where it's going, we've got a lot to be thankful for and be blessed and grateful, and definitely it's time to celebrate. Absolutely. It's just it's a matter of time before the the Pirates win uh, and uh, win at a high level under Mike Houston. Who knows? I mean, like, like Coach Holtz always said, and we're not putting any limits on this thing. I know Coach Houston would – or I, I guarantee you that that he's um, – and he's feeling hey. along those lines, and and kind of um, a, a note concerning the opener against NC State. That game is going to be televised on the ACC network, as we and as was announced uh, several weeks ago, or even months ago now. But uh, I recently saw that West Durham, Woody Durham's son, <laughs> fun, funny enough, uh, is going to be the play-by-play for that game. Very excited, and uh, West is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, hopefully, he's. Um, you know, we're just talking about Dave Trevecki. The Wes uh, is on my bucket list. So, Wes, if you're listening, uh, we really want the mayor of the ACC on this podcast, and uh, we'll keep reaching out to him, and I know that his schedule will eventually work out. The guy has got like 50 jobs, so it's not – he's a very nice guy and very talented, and uh, look forward to having him on uh, very, very soon. Do you want to go to that next interview, Bubba? Yeah, let's talk some more baseball. It's a guy that we've wanted to have on the show for a long time, and uh, so we actually um, had made plans to catch up with him right there after the College World Series because he was out in Omaha for a bulk of it. Um, But things didn't work out, but we're so glad to have him on now. And this is a guy um, who just accomplished so much, not only in baseball, but just just in life, and that is George Whitfield. And let's talk to Coach Whit right now. Well, anytime we can talk baseball, I'm all for it. And, Bubba, we have a very special guest. We've been trying to work out our schedule. So happy to have him on. Absolutely. I wanted to catch up with this guy I'm back shortly after the College World Series ended. Um, but like Dave said, um, the timing just wasn't, wasn't right. But I'm very excited to catch up with him now. Uh, anybody that follows baseball in the state of North Carolina, uh, this guy has made an impact on uh, high school, legion, and uh, college levels. George Whitfield. George, welcome into the show. Well, nice to hear from you, and I uh, hope you're not uh, dying with the heat this summer. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. Evil today. You're right about that. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, I was, terrible. I was at, it is, it is 95 fight. here in China Grove. Uh, so uh, about, right here, about 30 minutes north of Charlotte, the hometown of uh, Eric Tyler. I know you remember Eric. I do. I certainly do. <laughs> yeah, yep. We had 90, it's been the 90 plus degrees, but I don't know what it was at practice this morning. For ECU yeah. football, but it was really bad this morning. I'm, uh, I, I can't imagine what those guys are going through. Uh, it just seems like to me. I don't know. I may be wrong, but back when I was playing back in the '52, three and four year, it just didn't seem like to me it was as hot as it is today. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. 
No, I think you're right. I remember as a little kid in the uh, – um, I was born in 73, and uh, I'm older than the other two guys on the podcast, George, and it just seems uh, like in the 70s, I don't know, in the 80s maybe, that it was hot, but it doesn't, I, I agree with you, it feels like there's uh, like even 10 or 15 degrees maybe hotter, I don't know, it just it seems sure there's does. something different, something different, I agree with you 1,000%. Yep, sure it does. Well, we wanted to have you on, obviously we appreciate all that you've done for baseball, I come from a baseball family. So um, my my uncle Roger um, pitched in the major league. So I um, we wanted to have you on, obviously, for your knowledge of the game, and certainly we're very proud of Coach Cliff Godwin at ECU. And uh, certainly um, we had a special back during the time of the Keith Leclaire Classic on Coach Leclaire, and I guess uh, I guess we can talk about that. Uh, how did Coach Leclaire? Did he reach out to you to become uh, one of the? I know the coach there. Well, it was kind of strange. I, I had uh, I was coaching at, at uh, Pitt Community College, and then I got prostate cancer, and so I had to be operated on, and I was getting well, and I was sitting at home one morning eating some cornflakes, and the telephone rings, and it was Keith, and he said, George, he said, this is my first day on the job at East Carolina, and uh just wanted to call and say hello. I hadn't seen you in nine years. He was at the time coaching at Western Carolina. And uh, so he said, if you get a chance, drop by today and say hello. So I, I thought, well, I'll do that. So I drove by there and went in his office, and he got up and closed the door, and I thought, what, what's going on? He said, look, he said, I'm going to cut to the chase. I'd really like for you to think about helping me here at East Carolina. And I said, well, Keith, I said, I don't usually make uh, rash decisions, but I said, I I think I'd really enjoy that because I wasn't living but about three blocks in the ballpark at the time. And uh, so that's how we got together, the first day that he was there, and I stayed with him till the last day. He he was a great, great, great person, uh, a greater person than he was a coach. He was a great, great coach, but he was a greater human being. And – from from his perspective, and it certainly made a lot of sense. And with your background um, across the state of North Carolina, but especially in the eastern part of the state, um, you know, high school and Legion ball and so forth, um, it certainly made sense why he would want someone of your caliber and with your um, Rolodex <laughs> on his staff. I don't know. I don't know about <laughs> that. But, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, he treated me great. And uh, he was one of those coaches that he. We had a practice plan, and we all had something to do. We'd go from station to station, and, and we had something to do. And he didn't look over your shoulder. He gave you a job to do and expected you to do it. And uh, just a wonderful guy to work with. Nobody that's ever worked with Keith LeClaire could ever say anything but the highest things to him because he's just a wonderful person. Now, Coach, I know you were originally from from Kinston, correct? And um, I was. I, I know um, actually an article that I had read um, a while back uh, preparing for this interview when I thought it was going to take place here a month and a half or two ago. Um, you know, uh, there early on in life, uh, you were dealt some things that you had to deal with. And I believe your mother passed away when you were only 18 months. And then also mm-hmm. uh, your father passed away at and the early age of 12. So, uh, and I know you had someone that really played a key role in your development. Um, so tell our listeners about that. Well, I, I, that was when my mother died at a year and a half, she had a dear friend by the name of Ada Haynes. And my dad was his business. He was a dentist and he had practice out of town. So he asked her, would she be willing to come and stay at our house and look after my sister and I? So that's what she did, and then when my dad died, for some reason, he left the care of my sister and I to two half-aunts who were older, and and they didn't want children around. And so it was a very unpleasant situation of which I was fortunate to get out of with the help of Amos Sexton, who was the basketball coach at, at Granger High School at that time. And so he adopted me when I was 14 years old, and and that turned out real good. Well, that's amazing, especially Bubba and I have children, and I can't imagine uh, what you went through. And certainly my kids uh, have a five-year-old daughter, six-year-old son, and a 20-year-old stepson, and I can't imagine if uh, something happened to me. And then I know there are people out there that would take care of them. I'm not saying that, but I just can't imagine 
you having to go through that? Well, it was it was really uh, a uh, an experience that I uh, did not like at the time, but I am so grateful to the good Lord who uh, provided a, a, a Mr. Sexton. I went when I had the, my second time. They sent me off to school. I ran away from two schools by the time I was fourteen years old. And the second one, I, I bummed back uh, from Lynchburg, Virginia, in the middle of the night, and got a ride on a Thurston truck who let me out on the steps of Granger High School. Well, I'd never seen Amos Sexton and Frank Mark in my life. I just read about him in the newspapers and knew we had some mighty good teams at Kinston, and I, I wanted to be a part of it. And so I got out of that morning and went upstairs, and uh, the la- lady in the office introduced herself as Catherine Smathers, who was the school secretary, and she said, well, Coach Mark and Coach Sexton will be in by 8 o'clock, and, and you're welcome to wait and talk to them. So I did, and they walked in together, and she said, Frank, she said, there's a young man uh, that's got some problems, and he needs to talk to you. And he said, well, send him in. So I wasn't in there 10 minutes when Mr. Sexton, who was the basketball coach and assistant football, and Mr. Mark was the head football and head baseball coach. So really we didn't have but about two coaches, two or three coaches back in the 50s. And uh, Mr. Sexton said, well, Frank, I'll just take him home with me tonight. So that's how it happened. His wife had no idea she was gaining another boy. She had two, one four and one two, and then she gained one (laughs) fourteen. Now, Coach, coming out of high school, um, was it Lee's McRae you played at before you eventually went on to complete your PE degree at ECU? I did. I played at Lee's McRae for Coach Dickerson. I played basketball there and, and played baseball uh, and Coach Dickerson was a wonderful coach, and he died uh, a year and a half ago at 106 years old. Wow. I went to see him when he was about wow. 100, and he still remembered me, and I couldn't I couldn't believe that, that he would remember me after all those years, but he did. Wow. That's incredible. Well, I'd love to have those genetics uh, for sure. Yeah, I would too. Listen, I went to visit him. I went to visit him at 100 years old, and picture this. I drive into Mars Hill, and mm-hmm. I stopped at an Exxon station, and I said, could anybody direct me to Fred Dickerson's house? And the guy said, oh, yeah, I can direct you, but I'm not going to direct you to the house because he's not there. He said he's down at the tennis courts playing tennis. And I drove down, and they was at 100 years old still playing tennis. Wow. Oh, my God. It's <laughs> unbel- love unbelievable. Wow. Loved, I'd he love was, to be alive at that 100, much less playing tennis. <laughs> he, was a, he was a neat, neat guy and a, a wonderful coach, and, Probably as good a junior college football and basketball coach as, as our state's ever known. And so, coach, you yeah, got junior college, and eventually it went on. Um, I went my freshman year there, uh, coach, and it was uh, literally uh, for my freshman year before I went to transfer to East Carolina. And by that point, at some time, I guess in the 80s, I guess, um, it yeah. became four, four That's years. That's right. Lee's McCray became a four year school. Right. Yep. Sure it did. It's a, it's a wonderful school, Wonder, wonderful. It really is a great place. Yeah, I've got a funny story I'll tell you, Coach, real quick, and we'll get back to you. Uh, when I was there, um, growing up, I'd always, Bubba, I know it's from the western part of the state, but I've always been from the eastern part of the state, and so every time it had a, an inch of snow, we got out of school. And so when it started snowing in October of 91, when I was my freshman year of college there, I was so excited because I didn't think I had to go to class, and at that point, they everybody laughed at me, the upperclassmen, and I said, why are y'all laughing? They said, this school has only been closed in, in its history four times because of snow, and it's because they couldn't get the doors open. There was so much snow. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I can remember that way because I'm, I was there, let's see, I was there in 55 through 57, and there were a couple of times there. In fact, there was one time that went 93 days before I saw the ground. Oh, my God. I mean, every time that it would start to melt, here comes another heavy snow that night. And it was 93 days, I counted, before we ever saw the ground. Wow. So it was, it was uh, but it's a wonderful school, and uh, I have a lot of good memories from there and still have a lot of friends that uh, I keep up with that went to school with me there. And Coach, where did, uh, after... Lee McCray, you went to East Carolina. Can you I went to East college? Carolina and graduated in uh, 59. And from there, uh, I went to Goldsboro High School and coached there for eight years. And then I left and went to Richmond County where I stayed 25 years. And then came back and uh, 
went to uh, Pitt Community and started the baseball program there. And then I got uh, cancer, and then I helped Keith for six years, and Billy Godwin for one. And then I thought, sure, I was through and, and got talked in in 2015 to go into uh, be the head baseball coach at Rendell Parrot Academy in Kinston at 79 years old, which I had no idea that I'd ever do something like that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never, that's one thing about it, uh, Coach, isn't it? That no matter how much, I know Bubba and I, both, he's still coaching, but, um, but no matter how much you uh, you think you're going to get out of it, there's always a way that you get back in the game. And certainly, um, I know that for listening to, about you for many, many years, I know how much you love the game, and there's nothing like the game of baseball. I just love it. Oh, it is. It's, it's great. I, I just happened to be taking my grandson, who uh, ran across country at Parrot, to practice one day, and the headmaster was out there by the curb, and he said, Coach, I want to talk to you about something. I had no idea what it was about. He said, I want you to think about uh, coaching our baseball team this spring. I said, Dr. Bright, did you know I was 79? And you got to be crazy to even ask me. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, I think you still got it. And you got a lot of energy and, and everything. And our boys will gain a lot by being around you. And you'll gain a lot by being around them. And uh, so about that time, somebody came up and started talking to him. So I drove away. Well, about seven weeks later, one Saturday morning, I was home. And the phone rang. And Dr. Bright wanted to know when I was coming over to Kinston. I said, well, I happened to be coming over today to pick up some clothes at stadiums for Clothier. And he said, well, drop by my office. I'd like to talk to you. So when I walked in, he first thing he said, he said, how much would I have to pay you to take this job? And I said, well, if you had to pay me what I got paid in high school, it wouldn't be much. And then I said something completely out of character for me. I said, Dr. Bryce, I said, you know, I got a grandson who goes to school here. He said, oh, yeah, I know Nicholas. And he said, I said, well, would you put him through the last two years of school uh, if uh, I did it? He jumped up off of his desk. He said, you bet your life. Well, then I was in between a rock and a hard place. And uh, <laughs> so then I couldn't do nothing there. So anyway, we started off, and uh, we were three and three and looked like the bad news bears. And we went to Wilmington down there to play a school. And uh, on the way home, I told the boys, I said, if we wanted to get really good, We've got to go against some higher competition. And I said, there's a big tournament over at Fleming Stadium in Wilson in two weeks during Easter holidays, and all the schools in it are 3A or 4A. And we're 2A private school, and uh, we need to be in that tournament if you boys will give me your word that you'll stay here during Easter holidays and play. So I said, you go home tonight, talk to your parents, let me know. Next day they came back and said, yes, sir, we want to play. I swear to you, this is unbelievable. We've been over that tournament. We've been, we beat Wilson Fike, Northern Nash, and Southern Nash three straight games. Had five of the nine players on the all tournament team, had the most valuable player, and played out of our minds. And I never thought we could play that good. And then they started thinking they were pretty good. And we went on and won 16 in a row and won the state championship. Wow. Most amazing thing that I have had happen to me, I swear I would have. If you'd have told me that the first day I saw them, I'd have told you you were insane. <laughs> That's the way it usually works, right? When you have the expectations of, yeah, this team will probably do it, even though you have confidence in your team, you still don't know how, you still have to play the games, you still don't know how the injuries That's right. are affected and all that. You, you never know what's going to happen. You sure don't. Yeah. Okay. Now, Coach, something we hadn't mentioned about your career yet, and I don't recall exactly what year it was, but um, I know you spent one season down at Mississippi State, uh, down in Startville, obviously tremendous baseball tradition and atmosphere down there. So can you talk about that experience? Well, that was a great experience. After It was the 76-77 school year, and Ron Polk had been a friend of mine for a long time. And uh, so he kept saying, why don't you come down here and get your master's and help me for a year? And he said that back in the 70s, 71, all the way. Finally, in 76, 77, I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to stay in it, I might as well get my master's. So uh, I went down there, 76, 77 a year, and uh, it was a great experience. I met uh, some wonderful coaches, Mark Johnson, who later coached at Texas A&M, and is a dear friend, and I met so many, uh, Keith Madison, who was at Kentucky for many years, and a lot of good people who I still 
stay in touch with now. And we had a good team, I think. We were about 36 and 15 or something like that. We didn't get to the Nationals or anything, but we had a pretty good team. And uh, I enjoyed it and learned a lot from Ron. And he was naturally, he was the most motivated, uh, organized human being that I've ever seen. He had a baseball notebook that he wrote. It was about 600 pages with everything that could possibly happen. And he sold, I don't know, thousands of them. But uh, that was a fun year. Uh, I had to stay in the dorm with the players which was an interesting thing. Uh, Buck Showalter, who managed the Orioles, was my next-door sweet mate, and he was a junior who had just transferred to Mississippi State from Pensacola, and uh, Howie McCann, whose son plays in the major leagues now, and just a lot of good guys, and so it was fun. I was 40 years old staying in a college dorm with a bunch of 18 to 22 year old boys, so you can imagine what that was like. <laughs> Absolutely, and the the evolution of that ballpark, um, Polk Dement Stadium, uh, Duty Noble Field. Um, that's what my dad and some of his friends had the opportunity to go down there uh, last year when the Pirates had that spring break Mississippi trip. I did, I, and, uh, so I did was, too. That, I went down okay. there. What a what yep. a, what a what a ballpark now! I, I I hope I'm I'm able to make the trip and see it someday. Well, I tell you what, that may be. As fine a college baseball stadium as I have ever seen. I mean, uh, that, they didn't leave anything unturned. They got apartments out in left field, probably about six or uh-huh. seven stories high. Right. People rent those things. It's right. just crazy. And we can't we can't do that because we get rid of the jungle, right, Coach? That's right. We can't <laughs> we, can't we can't we can't get rid of the jungle. No sort of rebar. Uh-huh. Well, that's funny. Uh, you know, down there at Mississippi State, of course, they're notorious for the left field lounge, and now they now they call it the the left field loss. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. They uh, they used to pour beer on the top of the outfielders' heads when they went back to the wall to catch a ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure did. Now, Coach, but, it was uh, funny. A, a guy um, that I that I um, went to high school with, he's a couple years ahead of me. He ended up playing his college baseball at Charlotte, but Charlotte had um, a game or two down there at Mississippi State, and. Uh, it was it was hilarious. He thought it was awesome because I mean, he was like five three and playing left field. And they said, "Hey, number so and so." He said, "You want us to mow the grass so you can see?" And <laughs> he, he said, "He said I love it." <laughs> Listen, they they would ride those boys so hard. It was in good good sportsmanship back then. I, I'm sure there have been some games where it was a little rougher than it was others. But I'm telling you what, playing the outfield at Mississippi State back when they were bringing all the uh, vans and everything in with people sitting up. It was something else, I'm going to tell you that. It was something. Coach, we had the opportunity to talk to Audrey LeClaire and Lynn LeClaire, and I know that you uh, – did you go out there to Omaha? Um, I did. A couple months ago. So can you talk about the experience? And I also want to talk about your feelings on, on the current baseball uh, program at East Carolina, too. Well, uh, I, Audrey and uh, Lynn both came out and stayed the whole time. They actually stayed uh, three days longer than I did. I had to come back. I did not get to see Michigan play uh, Vanderbilt. I wanted to because of Eric and, and Nick Snobble, but I had to get back. Well, they stayed on, so they, I was out there with them about 13 days, and it was wonderful. I think Lynn wanted to come out real bad to see where Keith had wanted to come for so long when he was at East Carolina, and I had taken Audrey out there several years before for her uh, graduation present from high school. So she went. She and her girlfriend went with me out there several years before, and i never forget this long as I live. We were walking up the stairs to the uh, College World Series there, and tears were running down her face because she was so excited to see this place that uh, her dad had wanted so bad to get to, and uh, then we had a real good time this past year going out to eat and going to the ball game. So that was a lot of fun. Coach, I wanted to ask you as far as uh, I think the world of Cliff Godwin, I think he's a tremendous coach. And, I mean, what a program that he's established. Uh, I was just thinking about that yesterday. I know we had the interview with you uh, coming up, and I was just thinking about all the accomplishments that, that he's had in just a short period of time. Really, it feels like, He's accomplished so much. I've told Bubba before, it feels like the coach Godwin has been there longer, but already two of the three Super Regionals is under um, his belt. Yeah, that's right. Cliff is, is a great guy. He was a wonderful player for us. He was there when I was coaching with uh, Keith. He was a wonderful player, one of the most hard-nosed, 
dedicated players that I have ever been around. Played hard every single out of every game that I ever watched him play in. And uh, just uh, had a spirit about him that's a little bit different than other people. He, he loves to win, and he's going to work you hard, and he's going to teach you a lot and have you know the fundamentals and then let you go out in the game day and play. And uh, he's done a magnificent job at East Carolina, and I predict that it won't be long before he'll be in Omaha. We've been we've been close, and uh, but I believe he'll get there. I believe he'll get that dream. That's what his dream is. I think is to get to Omaha. So I believe he'll be there. I know that one question I had too. Do you um? Now what was your thoughts on Coach Rizell Dan Rizell leaving recently? Uh, the pitching coach of East Carolina. Uh. I have not had a chance to talk to Dan. I called him to wish him good luck, but I haven't been able to reach him. He's probably so busy out there. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he probably got uh, a lot more money, I'm guessing. Right. I heard that he doubled his salary, but I don't know whether that's true or whether that's just talk. But uh, Dan had three uh, wonderful little children and a wife, and uh, naturally if somebody could double their salary, that's kind of hard to turn down. Uh, especially in coaching. And uh, so I think he'll do a great job at Kentucky, but I'm sure that the person that uh, Cliff picked from Oregon to come in to take his place will do equally as well and has got a great background in coaching. So I feel good about our staff. Right. Uh, here, here about, I guess, three or four years ago, uh, he was named the Collegiate Baseball um, Pitching Coach of the Year. Uh, was that 2016? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. It's in Jason and Jason Dietrich is who we're referring to. Yeah, mm-hmm. and well, uh, he certainly got the credentials. He's got the experience, and so there's no reason that he can't come south and and have a great career. I know that uh, with your experience with Coach Leclaire and uh, coaching Cliff Godwin, now still following the program closely, is there something? I know it's hard to say, but is there something that you see? Is there anything as far as not the coaching staff, I'm not talking about them, but what about the fans? Is there anything that we can do to push the program to the great heights of Omaha where it's like if we don't make it to Omaha, it's going to come to a point, I think, that we're going to do so well. If we don't make it to Omaha every year, we're going to be very disappointed. Yeah, well, I hope that I hope that comes. I hope that's the feeling of people. If we don't make it, it's been a disappointment, but... I think that uh, I th- we got great fans, great fans in East Carolina. And this past year, we, you know, we we lost that first game, and then we came back, and won four straight, and that took a lot out of our yeah. guys. I think it was it was so tense, especially the state game was tense, and the Campbell game was tense because we could have got eliminated there. And then we had those four good games, and then I think we sort of hit a little down period, and we just happened to catch Louisville when they were on fire. Because early in the year, I saw Louisville play in the ACC tournament, and they didn't score, uh, get but four hits in two games. So if we could have caught them about that time, we'd have been in good shape. But they were red hot when we played them. Right. You're, like so, you. you're so right. With that. I'm sorry, but I was just going to quickly say you're so right. When that game against Quinny Piac had to play out of their mind, and they did, and we were just a few plays that we could have made or different things where we could have still won the game. and. And all yep. of a sudden, you find yourself with the, all the the rain on that first day, and it just seems like that that's part of uh, part of the game for us in Eastern North Carolina to have a regional and a lot of rain, right? Yep, that's exactly right. We had them had them right every year, but uh, I think Cliff. Uh, last time I was visiting him, I think he's brought in more pitchers this year, and so uh, hopefully we'll have enough pitching to get through a, a long deal like that where we had to play a lot of games back to back to back. And uh, but I, he's he's an excellent recruiter, and uh, Coach Palumbo that coaches with him is an excellent guy, and, and they they get good guys and quality people, and uh, they're doing a wonderful job. I want to ask Coach. you as far. I was going to ask. I'm sorry, Bubba. One more question. Um, I want to ask you as far as uh, yesterday, Bubba and I saw and, and Kyle that Coach Billy Godwin was named the new head coach of. Uh, the Spartans at UNCG. Did you have a comment on that? About uh, I thought that was great for him. Yeah, I'm so happy for Billy. I tried to call him about a couple of hours ago, but I can't reach him. He's probably got fifty thousand things going on. Uh, my comment about that was, uh, you know, he was working with the Yankees, 
And I guess that Billy had a gnawing in his stomach of wanting to get back into coaching, which is wonderful if that's what he wanted to do. Uh, and uh, I think UNC Greensboro is a great place. My grandson goes to school there. And uh, Link Jarrett, who was with Billy over at East Carolina, did a wonderful job of bringing that program around. And I believe that Billy will do likewise a great job because he's a tireless worker. He's a good recruiter. And uh, if that's what he wanted to do, I'm nothing but happy as I can be for him. What I want to ask you about, Coach, I know uh, I've heard you talk about this down through the years, uh, promoting it uh, when you've been on uh, from the booth with Jeff Charles. And um, uh, I've heard I've heard this discussed several years, and I know it's something that's been going on approaching 50 years now. I guess you started maybe in the early 70s. Um, but that's your baseball clinic. Uh, and um, Yeah, it'll, it'll start. We got, which comes up in January, January the uh, 11th. It's going to be in Goldsboro, and this will be the 48th year we've done it. Right. And, uh, right. So uh, I don't know how much longer I'll continue to do it, probably as long as I'm able. Uh, I enjoy it. I think the kids get an awful lot out of it. The college coaches that come are wonderful speakers and wonderful uh, people, and they get to answer a lot of questions to the kids and demonstrate and tell them about different things and we've had speakers from all over the country and we just completed our staff the other day for this coming year. In fact, Billy was on it because he at that time he was a scout with the Yankees. Now I got to go replace him because division one coaches can't do that anymore. They can't come to a clinic off their campus. That's another NCAA rule that I, I can't stand. I mean, it don't make any sense. They let Division two, Division three, junior college, and pro people come, but Division one coaches can't come. Isn't that crazy? Right. Wow. That's, that's, that's something crazy. I was curious about because I know I, I know it was that way with football and the North Carolina Coaches Association Clinic yep. in Greensboro, and then yep. um, obviously when Billy spoke there this year, he was still with the Yankees. But um, yep. there, there there was a there was a speaker Kermit Smith, who's the head coach up at App State, um, good buddy of mine, um, Britt Johnson's a recruiting coordinator up there, um, and I'm sure I'm sure you know of Britt, um, but yeah, but, but but yeah, I was I was wondering why. He could speak there at that clinic, and because, like, like you said, it makes no sense why they'd have it for football and not not other sports. Yeah, it don't make any sense at all to me. I don't know how he, how he got away with that, but uh, he did. And uh, but I knew Billy when the minute he signed with Greensboro, I said, "Well, I got to go replace him because he was going to talk on hitting." And uh, I said, "Well, he's going to be going to Greensboro, and they'll never let him do it. So I've got to find somebody to take his place." But we'll find somebody. That's not a problem. One of the things that that really impressed me and that stood out to me, I should say, as far as your clinic um, that you've done all these years, is the fact that it's um, it's free of charge. Correct? It's free, and uh, I pay for all the boys' lunches that come. Um, how many they are? We we take care of it. I go out and raise all the funds and their lunches and all their things are paid for. Yep. Well, I don't think there's another one like it in the United States that uh, it's free and uh, they get their lunch paid for. And coach, it shows again that your commitment and your love of the game, because you're a legend and uh, you're, I know you're just uh, what I know about you. You're a very humble person and you could easily with your name, put up there and charge a whole bunch of money, but yet you're doing that for, I guess, the development of the game and the love of the game, right? Well, that's never been that's never been something I wanted to do is, is to make money off of it. I almost wanted to give the kids an opportunity to meet all these guys and, and have them know them and uh, do everything I could to make it as easy for them as possible. So we've had a lot of good people that have helped us. Uh, last year we had people that contributed from 22 different states. Well, I want to add a question um, regarding another thing I thought about, being that you were you were the volunteer assistant, right, at East Carolina? I was, uh-huh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the NCAA, where the coaches and athletic, I guess it was athletic directors recently voted that, that they wouldn't even give the opportunity for a Division One school to pay for that assistance and have a third no, assistant. No, that, that's, that's, that's another bad rule. They need another assistant. They got 35 players out there. And they got three paid coaches, the head coach and two assistants, and then a graduate coach. 
But uh, that's a crazy rule. They got in football. They got so many coaches they don't know what to do with <laughs> basketball the same way. But for some reason, and wh- who in the world came up with eleven point seven scholarships for baseball? Right. Where does that Where does that come from? I mean, that eleven point seven, and they got basketball, got fifteen, football's got what eighty five, and right. it's just mm-hmm. crazy. And if you can, don't you think that as far as speaking of scholarships as well? For example, with East Carolina being such a big time program, if we could raise the money, who's to say? I mean, what's wrong with having you know, if it's twenty, maybe double at twenty two, twenty three scholarships or something like that. But to have thirty five guys, and Bubba knows how I feel. I'm very passionate about that as well because I love the game of baseball. And I just, I'm just wondering, and maybe I know normally I'm not a conspiracy theory person, uh, coach, but I just kind of feel like that they don't want college baseball to be up there with basketball and football. That's my opinion, but I'll just leave it at that. Well, I I don't know whether that's true or not. It could be, but I think that the baseball coaches are getting so strong in the nation, especially the big schools and all, that they're going to get another system in the next year or two. I really believe that because it doesn't make any sense to have uh, 35 players on your roster and not 11.7 scholarships which means that most of your boys are not going to get much more than a fourth of a scholarship. And basketball and football are getting full scholarships. It's crazy. Right. It's as crazy as it can be. And the right. Fact like, that, uh, one thing that was funny is, what's, I can't think of the athletic director of Texas, the name is escaping me right now. He's one of the guys that voted again. They make, what, $200 million? I mean, they got plenty. They could pay for every scholarship that they wanted to. They could pay for probably 10 assistants of baseball if they wanted to. But he voted. I couldn't believe the AD of Texas. I couldn't either. Right. I couldn't either. A team that had been to the World Series next to the most times of anybody else, and they voted against it. (laughs) They're making all that money and then they're spending it, uh, pumping it back into uh, Tom Herman's program. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Lord. Lord. Yeah. Yeah, Coach, you. uh... What are your thoughts uh, as far as uh, the game of college baseball? I've been very excited. I know, Bubba, one of the, another thing that we're upset about is we're in the year 2019 and maybe with the ESPN Plus mobile app, but um, I'm hoping that we'll see even more games televised. I feel like that we're, it's better than it was, certainly growing up, but um, the game is growing, and uh, hopefully we can get those things passed like you talked about with the scholarships and the third assistant, but as far as the the sport, I just want to see more games on TV. Yeah, I think that would help baseball a great deal to see more games on TV. Uh, so many people watch that World Series, and it's great. And I think the ACC Network's going to be good to, to watch a lot of different sports, and they say they can do baseball too, so that's good. But uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful game, and, and it certainly needs to be uh, televised. And I don't remember the exact figures, but I, I saw something along those lines uh, when the College World Series was wrapping up uh, about the um, best of three championship series and and how the ratings stacked up compared to the best um, or the most highly viewed uh, major league games on those same days in um, in college baseball. And of course, it's the, it's the national title series, but but still, college baseball was was ahead of them. Well, I tell you what, that uh, Vanderbilt Michigan uh, series was fantastic. I was, of course, pulling hard for Michigan because uh, of Eric and uh, Nick, but I was happy for Vanderbilt because Coach Corbin's a wonderful fellow, and I've known him a long time. Eric used to coach with him when he first started. He was coaching at Vanderbilt. In fact, Eric was the one that recruited David Price, right, the pitcher, and, uh... the pitcher for the Red Sox. Yes, sir. Uh, I know um, I remember way back, and, uh, of course, Eric completed his time with the Pirates in 2000, and then he was on um, he was on Coach Leggett's staff down there at Clemson, and that's where that's I right. guess he, he initially crossed paths with Coach Tim Corbin. And um, yeah. we, actually had, we actually had Eric on there on only about 10 days or so after uh, the, the World Series had ended. And so, Did you good? Yes, sir, and we we asked him uh, about you, and uh, he was very oh, complimentary complimentary to you, and, uh, and talked about how influential you were in his life, and uh, how awesome it was to have you out there in Omaha. Well, he's very kind. I, I love those boys, and I it was nice to see him in Omaha, and and also to get to visit with their parents who I hadn't seen since they graduated, and 
in uh, what 2000? Yeah, 2000. One thing to mention, uh, we got a couple things before we let you go. I appreciate you staying so long with us. Um, one thing that I want to mention is uh, Coach LeClaire, uh certainly the coaching tree, he's got so many guys wearing 23 across the country. It's amazing. Um, Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, how much, I mean, it's obvious with that, but can you, you were on the inside there. How much of an impact did he have on those kids? Oh, he, he was he was a great leader. And uh, he he led by example. He was not a big talker, and uh, he didn't make fiery speeches before the games and all that kind of stuff. But he we practiced so hard and went over so many fundamentals that when the game started, it was just sort of second nature. They went out there and played. But he put a spirit in them that uh, was hard to beat. I, mean, I remember some games we got behind early, five, six runs, and they believed they were going to come back every time. It was just amazing. And he was a great recruiter, too. I mean, he had not only was he a great coach, he had a great coaching staff, but he also was able to recruit a lot of great guys to be able to get him very close to Omaha. Yep, yep. And we'll, I just hope the Pirates can get there in the years to come. And, and uh, I know that that would be a thrill for him to see him there. And, and kind of uh, one one final story to wrap it up I mean, is concerning Coach LeClaire. I'm trying to remember. I heard this on Pirate Radio, I guess it was, several years ago. Um, but they were talking about um, how um, East Carolina, we had just beaten in, – not NC State. We were playing at NC State, just beat Miami at NC State um, when Hurricane Floyd had hit in 99. And Chad Tracy and some of the baseball guys were up there, of course, and uh, – Coach LeClaire saw Chad Tracy on the goalpost, and uh, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't, wasn't, wasn't too excited about it. I was going to see if you you could uh, if you did remember it, and since and since you did, um, I heard I remember, that, that I, big Coach LeClaire said it's in, in that soft spoken voice of his. He said, he said, Chad, he said, he said, you're a Division One baseball player. You can't be on the front page of the paper doing something like this or something to that effect. <laughs> He did. He said that in practice. We were down in right field, and he said, uh, somebody's told me that we had some boys climbing goalposts in the football game. He said, who was that? And Chad held up his hand, and, and he said, we, we don't need that. We don't need that kind of publicity in something. He, you know, he treated it very lightly, but he, he meant not to be not to be out there you know, showing your tail at a college game. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Coach, uh, I know that you uh... – Bubba told me I didn't notice that you won the uh, the highest honor in North Carolina, Long We Pine. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, uh, that's a long time ago. That was back in 1980. That was uh, back many moons ago. I know, but it's still that's still a big deal. Most people in North Carolina don't win that award. I I, I don't think I can't speak for Bubba, but I doubt I'll ever win that award. So that's <laughs> well, it was very it was very nice and appreciated very much, but it. Uh, uh, you know, when you win awards like that, it's, it's always you got so many people to thank and, and uh, that have been good to you. And so uh, awards like that uh, are nice to get, but they they should be shared by a lot of people. Absolutely. Well, Coach, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. We were looking forward to having you on, and I'm glad that it was uh, this was the time that it was meant to be. And um, thank you for all that you've done for baseball, for not only the state of North Carolina, but the nation. And Obviously, with your alma mater, East Carolina, it means a lot for those of us that lead purple and gold, and we look forward to meeting you someday in person very soon. All right. Well, listen, thanks for calling, and enjoyed, enjoyed talking to you. Thanks very much, Coach. Uh, what an honor to have him on. And, Bubba, he's another one. We, You and I have been talking back and forth, and uh, I know the schedules didn't work out, but uh, there's always the perfect, there's the perfect time, and the time it's meant to be. And to have him, and I, I just feel honored. How about you? I hear those interviews back. I just feel honored to be on the same show with Dave Trebecki and him. Oh my gosh, it's just a uh, right. It's a great feeling. Uh, do you feel? I don't know. Is it me? It just uh, those were two heavyweights right there we had on our show. And uh, by the way, folks, if you're wondering, Kyle is on assignment, so he couldn't be with us tonight. He's working hard, so uh, we miss Kyle from McGrane. Right. Just want to give him a shout out. But uh, certainly, man, um, wow, what a show and. Certainly, those two guests are tremendous. Bubba, I know that. Do you have more notes you want to talk about? Uh, well, I, I'm sorry, uh, I lost you there for a moment. 
I was saying, do you have any more notes uh, before we go? No, I, I was just going to plug our 50 and 50. Okay. Of course, so we're a little over halfway there, um, about three weeks, a little over three weeks to opening day. And so with that being the case, um, we still have, I guess, 21 or so, 22 of those 50 and 50 interviews headed your way. And the the most um, the one that's going to be headed your way here shortly um, is a guy that has tremendous accolades and so many accomplishments, much much like um, these two guests that we had on this podcast. Oh, and, yeah. And, and it's going to be Jerry Tolley. He's, he's in uh, several halls of fame in East Carolina, Elon, uh, the NAI Hall of Fame, um, as a result of winning two national titles and playing for a third um, during his time there with the Fighting Christians, as they were at the time prior to becoming the Phoenix. Um, so just a remarkable man and, you know, Jerry Tolley, he's, he's still to this day, the mayor of Elon and has been for 22 years. A yeah, very sharp guy. And, you know, one thing I will tell folks is if you played at East Carolina and uh, you want to come on, you're going to come on this podcast. You're always welcome. And, uh, I don't want anybody and Bubba can tell you and so can Kyle, when we started this podcast, one of the things that we want to do is honor the players. And uh, we don't have specific eras that are our favorites. And uh, something that I've always wanted, obviously we, we can't, unfortunately the guys, we didn't start the podcast sooner. There was no such thing as a podcast where we could interview guys from way back when. I think the first season was, what, 1932, and there's some time in there where the war, where there's not a couple seasons where we didn't have a team. But um, we want, we obviously, I wish we could. But um, I felt like with the Stasevich era um, was probably, it was, the era that really turned things around, I think, for the program, and uh, what a great coach. Uh, I mean, if you could go back in time, Bubba, that would be really cool. Him and Ed Emery, uh, for example, are two coaches that you would love to have on this podcast, and it would be fun. You wish you could. You can't. Um, but I want to make very clear to folks that uh, we don't have favorites as far as eras of football at, at Pirate Nation, um, the former players. That was just tremendous to have him on for 50 for 50, and hopefully we can have more players on during um, – if, if there's anybody in the 50s or 60s uh, on, then we'd love to have them. Well, the 50 for 50, folks, is coming up, and uh, we have that going on all the way through Friday, August 30th, and we'd love for you to be there. Also, folks, I uh, want to remind you about our cruise next year. I think it's the 15th to 19th of July, and we're going from Charleston to the Bahamas. It's a four-day cruise. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, call my good friend Dana Shrink at Dana's Global Travel, 919 919- 830-4161, 919-830-4161. Go ahead and make your deposits then. As you can get part of the group as low as $25 per person right now to, to help hold your spot in the group, and that money will be put towards your deposit. If that's what you have to do, love for you there. Hey, um, by the way, we have practice reports coming up. Don't forget to listen to that exclusively on SoundCloud. And, of course, the 50 for 50, the 50 Pirates in 50 Days is going to be on both SoundCloud and YouTube. And, of course, our podcast is everywhere. For Bubba Rosenbaum, I'm Dave Richmond. Thanks for listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. You've been listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. Join us next time as the guys will be objective, and the objective is sports.